What's up YouTube? It's Isaac from Eons, back with another video. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about my signal chain, so how everything fits together in my setup. And I wanted to make this video because I was about to make one of the walkthrough videos for one of my songs, and I realized that the way all the pieces of the puzzle fit together to make the sound is complicated enough to warrant its own video. So um, I may end up making some more specific videos for each one of my setups, like my drum setup, my guitar setup, etc. But I think as I get into the walkthrough videos that that's going to make, that, that'll be enough to explain that. Um, but this will be kind of a more basic video, just talking through some of the essentials and how all the pieces fit together. So here we go. If you're a non-musician, uh, it might be worth explaining what a signal chain actually is on a fundamental level. And when you make noise, music, whatever you want to call it, uh, and record it, that, those, air, those sound waves that travel through the air are converted via microphone or MIDI or whatever instrument pickups and guitars into electrical signals. And then those electrical signals are routed through usually cables or some type of gear that processes the signal. And then it's rerouted out to something that then recreates an audio waveform, a, uh, a sound wave, from the electrical signal that's coming out. So on a very basic level, you can imagine me singing something into a microphone, that microphone converts that to an electrical signal, that's then sent to a computer, and then when you hit play on a video or on a song, then that computer translates that electrical digital information into sonic information. So perhaps obviously signal chains are pretty important when you talk about modern music because so much is done with computers and there's so much sound processing in between just someone singing and what you hear at the end of the, the day out of your laptop speaker or out of your headphones or something. And um, one of my goals with this series of videos is just to try to illuminate that process a little bit. There's a lot of technicality, a lot of intricacy in that whole process. The whole audio engineering world is very vast. But hopefully, if you're a musician or non-musician, you'll be able to understand things a little bit more clearly after watching these videos. All right, so let's start with the vocal chain, and let's begin at the top with the microphone. So as you can see, I'm using the Shure SM7B, which I'm really, really happy with. It's what's called a dynamic microphone, which basically means that the airwaves that are made by the voice are immediately transferred into electrical signal through a specific process that I just won't go into right now. But that's essentially how a microphone works in the shortest way possible. And I really, really like this microphone for a lot of reasons. I think it has a nice, open, warm sound. A lot of people tell you the pre-amplifier you use, the thing you use to power the microphone, is going to influence the sound on a mic like this. And they're right. Um, the 7B is great because it has a little pickup in it that actually keeps it from picking up any hum from computers and other digital equipment. So if you're doing home recording or you're in a studio where you're near a computer or near other gear a lot, this is a really nice microphone. In fact, this microphone's been used on a lot of famous records. Uh, Thriller by Michael Jackson, for example. Um, Blood Sugar Sex Magic by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Lots and lots of timeless records made with the SM7B. That is running through a Mogami cable, and you'll see that I use all Mogami cables throughout my setup with the exception of the guitar cable, and I'll talk about why that is in a second. And I just really, really like Mogami's stuff. They're super, super quiet, and I feel like they really bring out the ultra-high frequencies and the ultra-low frequencies of my sounds for my instruments, and just give me a nice, clear, true sound that I, I'm really, really happy with. They're a little expensive, but I still really recommend them. Uh, so that is traveling down the microphone stand to the Boss VE20 vocal processor. And this is where all my vocal processing comes from. There's nothing uh, uh, more processed on the vocals after the fact once it gets recorded, uh, at, at least as far as the live videos go. So this guy is awesome. Um, it allows me to turn on vocal harmonies. I can turn off those harmonies at will turn on delays, turn off delays, reverbs, etc. And I'll be honest, I haven't experimented with a lot of vocal processors. I know there are a few others out on the market, not just Boss. But I'm really, really happy with the Boss gear that I have. I feel like it's really durable, it sounds good, and I'm just comfortable with the interface. So those, those are the main reasons I'm using that. I also like the small footprint of this. And um, 
I think the build quality is just really, really good. So that is then going out into the Boss RC50 loop station, and it's going right into the microphone input, the dedicated XLR microphone input. Uh, when I say XLR, there are different types of cables that uh, connect musical gear, so this is what's called an instrument cable or a quarter-inch cable. And uh, this is what an XLR cable looks like. It has three little pins in it. Let me put that back in there. And I'm going to talk about the intricacies of the, the RC50 loop station in a future video, many future videos probably. But what you'll see is this is sort of the brains of the operation as far as my setup goes. So everything travels into this first before it goes out to any recording equipment. And I guess that's not 100% true because the loop station is kind of a piece of recording equipment itself. But that's a, essentially what allows me to loop the phrases that I'm looping, um, record, re-record, delete, overdub, and sometimes even reverse tracks, etc. And I'm going to be getting super in detail into that when I get into the song-specific videos that are coming soon. Um, so that's the vocal signal chain. I'll talk about where things go after the loop station a little bit later. Okay, we were just talking about the vocal signal chain, so let's move on to the guitar. And as you've probably noticed, or if I haven't introduced you yet, I play the Ibanez S-Series electric guitar, which I really, really love. And uh, I love it for a lot of different reasons. Number one, it's very light and it's very thin. Let's see if I can show you here. Uh, versus a normal guitar, it's an all mahogany body. You can see the neck is quite thin where I'm holding it. It's what's called the neck and then the body, the black part, is also very thin compared to a normal guitar. And I really love the feel of this guitar, I love the sound of this guitar, and I'm going to talk a lot about it in future videos. Um, but for those who are interested, this is a mid to late 90s model Ibanez. I'm not exactly sure what year it was made, it may be early 2000s and it has the QM and QMS pickups in a really, really nice array that, that if you know anything about those pickups, you know that they're really clear, really clean, and really balanced. They're good for a lot of different styles. And then it has the Edge Bridge, which is just phenomenal. And I got an insane deal on this guitar back in the day. I bought it used uh, from a store in Berkeley, California, called The Starving Musician, great store. And I bought it I didn't know the guy, but I bought it from a guy who had it before me who took really good care of it. So I feel really lucky to have this instrument, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to have it forever. Uh, but it's got the jumbo frets. It's got the Wizard 2 neck that's very thin, like I was talking about before. And the nice thin neck c combined with the uh, larger frets make the guitar what, you'll, what we would call very playable. So you don't have to put a lot of downforce on the strings to get the sound you want. You can bend things very easily. I play super light gauge strings just because I play a lot of different instruments, as you've seen. And I just feel like it's a little easier on my hands and makes, makes it just a little bit easier to play music. So obviously, all the guitar sounds begin here. And when you pluck a guitar string that vibrates, it's picked up very literally by a electromagnetic set of what are called pickups that then transform that vibrating sound wave into an electrical signal like I was talking about before. So that's routed out through actually a Hosa guitar cable that has a really nice nylon uh, wrap on it that I really, really like. And, and honestly, um, I just I don't use Megami here just because I have a backup Megami, but I like the sound of the Hosa and I like its durability and it's also a little less expensive and I step on it a lot. So just in case I ever ruin this, it's a little easier to replace and some of the other uh, studio cables I have. I use this um, A-frame stand, which I really, really like, because uh, as you see in my videos, I'm often picking up and putting down, get down the guitar as quickly as possible, and uh, this stand just makes life a lot easier for me there. I think it's by Ultra. Yeah, you can see right there. Great stand, really happy with it. Get my tremolo out of the way. And I'll talk in detail about uh, the, the various depths of guitar knowledge. Uh, in a future video, although you guys can probably find other videos on YouTube of people who know a lot more than I do. But anyway, the Hosa cable is going out uh, into what is called the Boss GT8 guitar effects processor. And if you know anything about Boss's GT series, you know that this is kind of an older model. I think I've had this exact unit for about 10 years. 
and I'm really, really happy with it. It's what's called a multi-effects processor, so there are lots and lots of different sounds that you can get out of just one box, which is really nice. You, you'll see my setup is complicated enough as it is. It's nice to have simplicity whenever I can get it in just one box with everything I need from the guitar is really, really helpful. So this allows me to s essentially play without an amplifier. It uh, uses what's called computer modeling, modeling to simulate the sound and response of a regular guitar amplifier, but without the need to actually have that. So um, this has delays, reverbs, choruses, distortion, all different types of stuff. And I just really, really love this unit. Like I said, I think the build quality of Boss is really great. I took this overseas. I lived overseas for a couple years, traveled around quite a bit with this unit uh, and the RC50, which is also by Boss. And these things have just held up amazingly well. It sounds great. Um, if you're super into gear, then you know the signal to noise ratio here is not amazing. But um, honestly, for my purposes at this point, uh, in my music making, it's not a big deal for me. So I'm um, really, really happy with this unit. This is what's called a volume pedal um, or expression pedal. And this allows me to change the volume with my feet instead of using my hands, freeze up my hands to do a little more with the guitar. And I feel like this unit just gives me a lot of flexibility. Uh, I can make very non-guitar-like sounds, which you'll hear a lot in my music, and I can make very guitar-like sounds and sort of everything in between. So the flexibility of it is just really, really awesome. So the uh, guitar signal goes out from the GT8 into a mixer, which is actually over here on the other side of the drum kit. And I'm using the Mackie 402 VLZ4 mixer. I just really, really like this mixer. It's super compact, really tiny footprint. Footprint just means the space it takes up on the floor. And as far as my setup goes, I feel like I get to hide the mixer really well over here for live performance, etc. And it's just very light, yet the build quality is really, really high. It's, these things are, I think literally the tagline is built like a tank. <laughs> um, but that's really true, and they sound very pristine. A really nice, warm sound and a lot of durability and longevity out of those Mackie mixers. So I'm really, really happy with it. Uh, the reason I just have a four-channel one is because I'm only using it for two channels. I put the guitar through there, and then I'll show you in a second. I also put the drums through the mixer. And the reason I do that is the actual physical inputs on the Boss RC50 are a bit limited. So if you want to have lots and lots of information going into them, multiple instruments like in my case, um, it's good to have a mixer that basically sums all those signals together and then pushes the combined signal out back to the mixer. So here's where the guitar sound comes in goes through here, just a little bit of volume processing, but uh, no special effects or anything, and then it goes stereo out, back to the RC50, which I will show you in a moment. But, why don't we get into the drum setup. Okay, as you've probably noticed, I play electronic drums, and I know that that is a little bit controversial for some people, but for me, as as far as what I use it, use the drums for in my looping setup, electronic is kind of the only way to go for me personally. Um, I did actually experiment with an acoustic drum setup in my looping setup uh, a few years back, and the microphones that pick up the drum sounds are always on when you're looping like that, and it's kind of a pain in the neck to turn them on and turn them off all the time. So then when you're doing other stuff like singing or playing guitar, or there's just a lot of music coming out of whatever amplifier you're using if you're playing live, that all gets picked up by the microphones in the drum kit, and that can be really problematic for your mix. It can really cloud things up in the mix and the sound and just make things not sound as good as they otherwise could. So I switched over to electronic drums, gosh, maybe six or seven years ago, and haven't looked back. Um, I'm, I still love playing acoustic drums, uh, but this has just been so perfect for my setup. So. Uh, this is a custom setup that I created from lots of different parts from disparate manufacturers, but at the moment I'm using all Pearl hardware, and by hardware I mean the stands, the pedals, um, the things that hold up the actual drums themselves. Um, I'm using the Pearl Eliminator hi-hat stand, which is just phenomenal with the two-leg design, allows me to fit the uh, GT8 in there, along with the double bass pedal, which is really fun, and also allows me to use a more realistic uh, hi-hat modeler as far as the electronic drums goes. I'm using all Roland V-Drums pads. These, these models themselves are from a few years back. 
and really, really happy with these. I know a lot of people complain about the extra bounce that this gives you and the rubberized rims, but for me, actually, I really enjoy it. I feel like it's a little easier on my hands, and it just gives me a little less fatigue when I'm playing and practicing for long stretches. Uh, and the build quality is really good, really durable, and the sensors are just phenomenal. So I've got the hi-hat ride, two rack toms, or I guess technically what you would call a floor tom, but it's mounted to a cymbal stand, a snare drum, and then kick drum, and the Pearl Eliminator double bass pedal. So those are creating what are called MIDI signals, and basically what that is is a different type of electronic signal that is then being filtered into the Alesis trigger I.O., which is a very um, simple piece of drum interface gear as far as electronic drums go, but this basically translates that uh, those electronic signals into what's called MIDI information, which is a format that this computer can understand. So these are relaying electrical signals to this, which is transforming into MIDI, which is then going directly into my laptop right here. Why the Alesis Trigger I.O.? There are a lot of different options for electronic drum uh, brains, I guess you could call it these days, but I really love this just because it's really simple. It's really small, it's really light, it's very durable, and it's also powered from USB, so I don't have to have an extra power supply or cable for this thing. It's just powered directly by the computer, and again, for live performance, setups, takedown, thing like that, things like that. just makes life so much easier, and it really works beautifully for um, what it's designed to do. Now, long term, would I recommend using this? I think it really comes down to what you want to do with it. But um, if you can get a Roland drum brain that then can communicate MIDI to the computer, you know, that gives you a lot more flexibility, and I may eventually go that route. But for now, I'm really happy with the Trigger I.O., so uh, thanks, Elisis, on that one. That's going into um, a, I believe, late 2009 uh, MacBook Pro, uh, which still has the CD drive in it, and that's running... That's running Logic 9, Logic Pro 9, which is hosting Superior Drummer 2.0. Um, Superior Drummer is essentially a collection of drum samples, and what we mean by samples is they're actual drums recorded in a studio that are then chopped up and put into a package so that when I hit this drum, the electrical signal in here then eventually triggers the drum sound of an actual drum being played by someone else years ago in an actual studio. So you do get an actual physical drum sound, which is really cool. And if you're not familiar with Superior Drummer and you do any drum programming or you do anything with electronic drums, I could not recommend checking that out more. It's just a phenomenal product. The sound libraries are insanely great. And uh, I'm just overall incredibly, incredibly happy with what I've gotten from that. So then the computer, you may laugh, is going out of the stereo headphone jack um, right into the, through an R, a pair of RCAs, into the tape in on the Mackie mixer, which like I talked about before, then goes stereo out to the Boss RC50. So it actually allows me to get a full stereo spread from my drum kit, which means, uh, you know, when you're listening back on your laptop, let's say you might hear the hi-hat out of the left-hand speaker a little more, and the uh, you know floor tom out of the right hand speaker a little more, which sort of makes it seem a little bit more like a live drum kit, which is always nice um, when we're doing simulation with electronics. Sometimes you want it to sound very electronic and very simulated. Other times you want it to sound very real, and it's nice to have that flexibility with this particular setup. So um, the drum setup is complicated enough that I may do a separate video on that, but for now, there's the signal chain for the drums, so let's follow that back to the RC50. Okay, so as I was talking about a moment ago, my Mackie mixer goes stereo out um, back into the RC50 through these two cables, which becomes a stereo input, and then that allows me to either record or loop or just bypass through the RC50, which then goes stereo output. Um, and what we mean by stereo is maybe beyond the scope of this video, but mono means there's just one signal coming straight down the center of your speakers and everything's smashed together on top of itself. Um, stereo means there's, there's a left side of the listening space as a listener and there's a right side of the listening space and there's a lot of stuff in between. So you can move different instruments around from left to right, etc. 
and um, try listening on headphones to a favorite recording of yours that's in stereo and see if you can spot, oh, they, you know, the, the people put the uh, guitar on the left-hand side and the bass on the right-hand side or something, or it sounds like the guitar is coming from my left. And it's just a, a really useful effect in music production that helps make things sound a little more live, a little more engaging for the listener. Um, etc. So if you're a musician, I don't want to bore you with a really basic example of stereo sound, but that's what it is. So this is going stereo out into my Apollo Twin Duo, which is that piece of gear right here next to the computer. And I couldn't be happier with the Apollo Twin. It's just a phenomenal piece of gear by Universal Audio, and that processes all the analog signals, meaning all the musical sound wave signals from the Boss RC50 and then converts them to digital, which it then sends to my computer that I use to record everything. So I'm going to be doing separate videos on my mixing, mastering, recording setup, but for now, just think okay, when Isaac's playing the guitar, you know, it's going through a cable, it's going into a sound processor, which is sending the signal to a mixer, mixer sending the signal back to the loop station, it's getting looped and recorded, and then all the musical elements that are coming out of that song or recording are then being dumped into something that makes it digital and then being recorded. And then when I play it back on my computer, uh, the, my computer is now transferring that to real sound. So. Um, the last little bit that I should probably talk about is I have integrated an iPad into my setup in the last, I don't know, eight months or so. And that's been really great. It actually just allows me to add a couple more elements to a song or arrangement while I'm playing. Like if I'm singing, I can kind of reach something here, which is a little bit different sound than the guitar and just gives me a few more options sonically. And I'm really looking forward to integrating that more. It's a great feature of the RC50 is I can go stereo out through the um, iPad's headphone jack and go straight into the auxiliary in on the Boss RC50. So maybe to give you a little better look at this from behind, here are my stereo ins. Uh, that is bringing in the drums and guitar. Here's my microphone in, that's bringing in all the vocal sounds. And here's my auxiliary in, which is bringing in the iPad sounds, which is usually a synthesizer or drum machine. And then these two cables are sending all the audio information after all of that stuff back out to the Apollo Twin and to your ears. <laughs> so that's pretty much the signal chain. Let's wrap it up. Thanks for checking out the signal chain video. Um, hopefully that illuminated some things for you, maybe got you thinking a little more deeply about how sound and music is transferred from one place to another, or maybe just help you think through your own setup and I'd just like to say, if you have any questions on anything I've gone over in this video, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, you can put them in the comments, you can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, etc. And if you're interested in staying up on what I'm doing and more videos like this, please subscribe. Otherwise, I hope uh, next time you check out one of my videos, you're seeing something that's a little more compelling for you. Um, again, it's Isaac from Eons. Thanks for checking everything out, and I'll see you guys in the next video. I know I can be what I want, I believe.